Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Closals. Welcome to our annual meeting with CEDC. You know, this morning coming here, my wife said to me, she goes, because I was nervous, very nervous, she goes, don't try to be too charming or witty or intellectual. Just be yourself. So I'll try. It's an honor to be elected this year. A little closer? Better? Sorry about that. It's an honor this year to be elected the uh, chairman of the board of the Columbia County Economic Development Corporation. Um, I'd like to thank my fellow board members for their confidence in me. I'd ask them all if they would stand for a moment and be recognized. <laughs> Of course, we'd be nowhere without our staff. Um, Lisa Droshek, Martha Lane, Carol Wilbur, Aaron McNary, Ed Stifler, and Kayla Dunst. You'd all give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> we have quite a crowd here this morning, and we have amongst us some of our elected officials. Um, Holly Tanner, PJ Keeler, Matt Norell, Art Basson, Maria Law, Kippy Weigelt, Sarah Sterling, Michael Schmidis, Linda Musman, Rick Scalera, Rick Rector, Skip Speed, Matt Herzog from D.D. Barrett's office, and Paul Scheika. We also have with us our past Congressman John Fasso. Finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Um, without our sponsors, um, there would be no economic growth in Columbia County. Um, our event sponsor is the Berkshire Bank, and I'd like to invite Jeff Stone of the Berkshire Bank up here to say a few words, if you would. Good morning, and thank you very much. Uh, Berkshire Bank is really proud to be the sponsor of this year's annual meeting. This is always kind of the best event in, in, the, in the year, and uh, we love being here. So thank you very much for allowing us to be your sponsor this year. Um, my colleagues and I couldn't be more pleased to be here. We have a big group of people here from, uh, from Berkshire Bank, so uh, I'm glad we're all here. Berkshire Bank has a strong presence in Columbia County. We uh, have lots of resources, commercial banking resources, private banking resources, and three branches. Uh, we've been here uh, quite some time and are pleased to be growing uh, significantly in Columbia County. The Berkshire Bank is a, is a bank of about $12 billion in assets, uh, large enough to have all the solutions that you would need, small enough to be flexible and take care of all of, uh, all of your needs uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, so thank you very much. We're glad you're here. Enjoy Hugh Johnson. We always enjoy hearing what Hugh has to say. Again, thank you for, uh, for being here this morning. Bye. I follow in the footsteps of Tony Jones, whose term was marked by his outstanding leadership and the growth of the CEDC. I'd like to ask Tony, there you are, and Mike, would you please come up? In recognition of Tony's uh, long term and four years as the board chairman, I'd like to present him with a gift. And he print of Hudson. Another member this year who's going to step down, Jim Campion. He's retiring this year from the college, and uh, as president of the college, he, he served on our board in that capacity. Please join me in giving Jim a big round of applause. And <laughs> We're in challenging times: high taxes, population loss, and a youth that tends to want to move away. 
work against a thriving economy. We have much to offer though. The Hudson Valley and Columbia County are one of the most beautiful places in the country to live. We have a diverse landscape with a small city and numerous hamlets and towns, each looking to thrive in their own way. Some want light manufacturing and industry, others prefer home-based business solutions, but they each offer a part of the solution. Our diverse and talented board encompasses leaders from many backgrounds. Each bring their piece to the table in achieving solutions that contribute to our growth. Our strategic plan, <coughs> excuse me, is our guide to the big picture. A review of this year has resulted in a renewed focus on shovel-ready sites to attract new business and provide expansion opportunities for existing businesses. Mike Tucker has been the driving force behind CEDC's strategy and progress, and I couldn't be more excited to work with him on bringing a meaningful economic development to Columbia County. And with that, I can present to you Mike Tucker. Thank you, Dave. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are delighted that you're here this morning, and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you to develop economic development opportunities for all in Columbia County. We're pleased this morning to uh, welcome several <clears throat> dignitaries to the podium. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce the chair of the Board of Supervisors of Columbia County, Matt Morell. CEDC has a contract uh, with the county as a not-for-profit economic development organization to provide economic development services. We work very closely with the Board of Supervisors and the individual towns, and we're very grateful to the board for their ongoing engagement and support. Ladies and gentlemen, the chair of the Board of Supervisors of Columbia County, the Honorable Matt Morell. Good morning. I'd like to thank the Columbia County Economic Development Corporation for their positive work and impact in Columbia County. I'd also like to thank them for the wonderful breakfast. I thought it was great. I'm going to go through a list of what I feel are accomplishments for Columbia County. Some of you may say, what, it ha what does it have to do with economic development? I think it has everything to do with, with economic development. Um, we have continued the upgraded status we received in 2017 by Moody's for 2019, which is a positive impact on our borrowing. Uh, with the help of Senator Marchione and now Senator Jordan, we were granted a million dollars to help pay for improvements to our emergency training center for our firefighters and emergency medical service workers. Through the leadership of our Columbia County Treasurer, P.J. Keeler, Columbia County will offset the cost of state-mandated cancer benefit insurance, helping our firefighters, and saving fire companies and taxpayers money. Now every public school district has a Sheriff's Department resource officer paid for in partnership with the school districts. The safety of our students is of paramount importance. The county continues to work on a shared services plan that included all of our towns and most of our villages and the city of Hudson with a potential savings of 1.8 million. We are making significant progress with our sewer line project in Greenport. I'd like to thank Greenport for their cooperation on this important project and the county has worked to receive zero interest loans and grants from New York State. Most notably a 1.5 million dollar grant through Senator Marchione and now Senator Daphne Jordan's office. But much, much work on the sewer line still needs to be done. We will continue to meet with Columbia, Columbia Green Community College and Green County to work towards stabilizing the college fund, our college funding, as this is an important resource for both Columbia and Green County. The county has undertaken a major capital project with financial help from Columbia and Green Counties I'm sorry, the college has undertaken a major capital project with help from Columbia and Green Counties to upgrade the facilities and create opportunities for local students. Uh, with that, I would also like to wish President James Campion well in his retirement. And it's been a pleasure working with you, President. 
I'm, I'm pleased to say that we've agreed to work jointly with Greene County on the opioid epidemic, and the two counties recently hired a two-county coordinator to develop an aggressive public awareness plan, as well as battling the opioid epidemic. So these are just a few of the things that I wanted to, to talk to you about. But with that, we still have a lot to accomplish. And we have, uh, every year our budget gets tougher and tougher to uh, stay within the tax cap and you know keep your taxes low. But thank you. On the way up, Chairman Morrell mentioned that I, uh, he thought I was going to tell a quick story. Uh, the first year I was here, I went in to see him at the end of the year, and I said, how am I doing? And he said, well, when you came, a third of us uh, liked you, a third of us didn't, and a third weren't sure. And I said, how am I doing now? He said, about the same, it's just different people. So, <laughs> But we truly uh, value our relationship uh, with the individual supervisors of the towns uh, and the representatives, uh, the supervisors in the city of Hudson. We're also pleased this morning to have with us the mayor of Hudson, Rick Rector. Uh, mayor Rector uh, has uh, been very, very active with economic development in the city, uh, particularly uh, in light of the $10 million downtown revitalization initiative funding that uh, Governor Cuomo awarded to the city a year and a half ago. Those projects are uh, becoming, uh, have been identified and are moving forward. And I value the relationship that uh, I have with the mayor and his office as well as the city. And CEDC also has a contract to administer the city of Hudson IDA. So we are very en engaged working with the city as we are with our towns. And it's a pleasure to have Mayor Rick Rector with us this morning. Mayor? Thank you very much, Mike, and good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be here with everyone on this lovely April morning. I think, as you all know, that the elections have been moved up three months. The old uh, song, April Showers, bring campaign yard signs in your yard any minute now. So <laughs> it's going to be happening throughout the county very quickly. Um, the elections that were usually held in September have been moved to the end of June for the primary, and the normal one will be in, in November. Uh, Congratulations to David Finger, and a huge thank you uh, to Tony for your incredible service to the to this county, the city, and the state. Uh, big congratulations to both of you. Um, I thank Mike Tucker and the entire Columbia County Economic Development Corporation for this annual event, which gives us a unique opportunity to meet with each other, talk with what's going on in the area, in addition to some good words of wisdom from uh, Mr. Johnson, which I'm really looking forward to uh, in a few minutes. My friends, I'm very happy to report that the city of Hudson is alive and well, as we read about every day. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it continues on its exciting and dynamic path that been, it's been on for the past several years. As most know here, and Mike just briefly mentioned, Hudson was awarded a $10 million downtown revitalization initiative grant uh, from the state of New York uh, that um, we probably wouldn't have had without Mike's and uh, CED's support. So the city's very thankful. Uh, I also want to thank Mike Yevely, who's here from Empire State Development today, as another good friend of Hudson. Um, so I'm happy to think Hudson's on the right track. Uh, Hudson recently put together a committee that has hired an outside consultant to oversee the, uh, the five components of the DRI grant for the city of Hudson. As you know, it's both a public and a private initiative. Uh, the grant from Hudson is, um, we selected a company called the Chazen Company, and looking very forward to working with them as they implement uh, this very intense and it's a complicated procedure with the five projects in Hudson, which are, just very quickly, um, the renovation of the historic Promenade Hill, the renovation and the shoring up of the Dunn Warehouse, a new stairway from Allen Street uh, to Cross Street, funding for the preliminary study and planning of Fergari section of the North Bay, and a major and exciting overhaul of infrastructure and streetscaping for the Front Street area from North to South Bay. Uh, again, the Columbia County Economic Corporation is a big reason for these transforming projects within the city. 
In addition to these exciting things happening downtown, the, uh, we're also in the final stages of the, and everyone's going to love this because I'm very excited about this, the uh, replacement of the Ferry Street Bridge. Uh, the design process is almost complete and construction for the Ferry Street Bridge to start uh, next year. Two new hotels are scheduled to open up this year. Uh, one at the Maker, which has already opened up a, a cafe and a lounge in the 300 block of Warren Street, and the Howard Hotel that will be opening up I hope this summer, uh, or late spring, in the 200 block of, of Warren Street. Um, the many new restaurants and, and, and stores that have opened up are keeping our residents and visitors well supplied with good shopping and good eating. Um, the county and the city are working very closely together, and we are very thankful as a community for the assistance and incredible support that we've gotten from so many county offices and individuals. Uh, a special thanks also to Dee Dee Barrett, who recently was awarded a $100,000 grant for a long overdue study of the traffic patterns around Hudson and inside Hudson. As many of you know, Hudson is the third busiest station, railroad station in the state, and we've been working very closely with Amtrak to increase the cars coming. Uh, as during the weekend, it's exceptionally hard to get a reservation, and during the summer months, it's virtually almost impossible. Um, both the city and the counts and, and the county are grappling with very serious issues, including housing and other things that go along with places that people want to live and be. Together, we hope to solve these, and we are going to deal with them as we continue to work towards solid, sustainable, and sound economic development for everyone. What a great county we live in. What a great time to be in Columbia County. What a great city I'm very lucky to represent. I wish you all the very best and a very good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. We're also very fortunate to be part of a regional, organ a regional uh, area. Uh, not just Columbia County. We work very closely with Greene County, but we also work extremely closely with the other seven counties in the capital region. Without the benefit and support and uh, direction of Empire State Development, uh, New York State's Economic Development Organization, we are, would not have the opportunity to uh, work and find grants, work to bring projects to fruition. Mike Evely is the Regional Director for Empire State Development. Uh, he and I have worked together for many, many years in various capacities. He and his team are incredibly supportive not only of the CFA projects through the Governor's Regional Economic Development Council, but as the Mayor mentioned, the DRI, but also in helping us with individual businesses who are seeking either tax credit allocations or grants. And the CFA process opens up tomorrow. Uh, last year we had over $1.3 million in CFA awards, the year uh, which is a, brings to a total since 2011 of over $23 million. That would not be possible without Mike and his team, and I'm pleased to introduce Mike Yeveli from Empire State Development. Thanks, Mike. You just took everything I was going to say about all the good work you're doing for Columbia County. But, um, say it again. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Um, you know, on behalf of, of Governor Cuomo, on behalf of Empire State Development, or Commissioner Howard Zemsky, it's always a pleasure to be here. I think this is the third breakfast I have done here. Um, it's, it's always great to see Michael. I, as, as he mentioned, I've worked with him for, for many, many, many years. Um, you know, he's very tenacious. Uh, believe it. He is uh, in our face all the time, making sure Columbia County gets their fair share or more. Um, he tells a story. I forgot exactly what I said years ago about you attend meetings that not, not only do you attend meetings that nobody wants you to attend. I forgot exactly what it was. <laughs> but it was because I was at a lobbying day for a very specific item on IDA legislation. And Michael shows up. He's in the capacity of running a Center for Economic Growth at our lobby day, and uh, believe it, he got in front of every legislator with his hand before we ever had a chance. So um, he's a great asset to you. Uh, he's a great asset to us in a regional council. 
Um, our co-chairs rely heavily on, on, on Michael uh, to, to carry out a lot of our public engagement work that we do around the region. Uh, our co-chairs are Ruth Mahoney from Key Bank and Javier and Rodriguez from New Albany. Uh, we also have great representation from your area as well. Uh, we have, um, of course, uh, Matt Nelson representing the Kinderhook area. Uh, we have uh, Melissa Oftemer, uh from, from Basilica Hudson. Uh, we have Todd Erling. Um, so, you know, you guys are really well represented, and uh, not only that, those members do a, a lot of work for us across the region, but also making sure our projects move forward in Columbia County and in Hudson. And it's, it's not a, a mistake that Hudson makes, gets that money, or it's by chance, it's because of this organized effort, the mayor mentioned that uh, working together, that was a big, big plus in them receiving that $10 million award. And he, he did mention a bunch of projects, there's a lot more within that uh, $10 million that's happening with Hudson, and on top of the projects the city's heading. Um, expansions in private sector businesses, affordable housing, um, and, and other public improvements. Um, the CFA, uh, the REDC process, which is the, is the gateway to quite a bit of money, usually about 700 or more, uh, 700 or more million dollars a year statewide. Uh, our region uh, has to compete for that money. All of you have to compete for that money. Again, Michael does a great job making sure Columbia County gets more than its fair share. So that process uh, really starts tomorrow. So. Um, stay tuned. It's going to be a very busy season, and uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that our region um, excels in that process. So I'd like to thank the mayor, the chairman. The chairman, you're right. The breakfast was great. You covered all four, four food groups. You got eggs, bacon, sausage, and ham. It was excellent. Um, Dave, like, great meeting you recently, and I, I'm looking forward to working with you. And of course, Tony was great working with you while, while you were leading the organization. So everybody, thank you all very much. What Michael once said to me was, "You go. To, some people go to meetings uh, where they're not invited. You go to meetings where you're not wanted. So. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> we are very fortunate again uh, for the fourth year uh, to have my good friend Hugh Johnson. Uh, Hugh and I have known each other for over 35 years, having uh, worked together when he was at First Albany and we were doing financings of nursing homes and senior housing and other projects. Today, Hugh is the Chairman and Chief Investment Officer uh, and a member of the Investment Strategy Committee at Johnson Ellington. Uh, his work on U.S. economy and financial markets uh, is well known. Uh, he has more than 40 years experience in this business. Uh, I think that uh, we know him well enough, and uh, I'd rather have him get up and give us his remarks, but he's a great friend. He's a national voice in the financial services area on television and radio, and every once in a while when I have uh, CBS News on, there's Hugh. So we have Hugh here. We don't even have to turn the TV on. Welcome, Hugh. You mentioned the, the radio. I, I was told the other day I have a, I have a face made for radio. Um, it's, it's, it is really great to be back here. It's, it's great for all, all sorts. Well, you know, the truth is you're the only group that's ever invited me back. But, no, the, the, it, it, it's, I, I, I've done a lot of these, a lot of speeches of this sort, and eventually I drop, I stop. But there's so you come back, you return to a place because of the group and its enthusiasm. It's it's uh, it's great community spirit, and that's what I see here. I not only see a real success, and you heard from the mayor about the success, and you get an idea from listening to people about the success. But you really have a success, and you should be very proud of the success, and you should be proud, particularly of the enthusiasm that you all share, the camaraderie and the enthusiasm. So it's really enjoyable. It's enjoyable to come back and, and visit with you. I'm going to do something. First of all, uh, we've got a limited amount of time, and if, if uh, uh, you know, we're, we're getting a little bit of a late start. So if you, during the course of some of the things I've got to say, my remarks, uh, you want to leave, you can. You see, I often start with very large crowds, and well, anyway, if you, if you, you get the idea. If you feel like you're uncomfortable, if you want to leave, you want to go home, you want to. Uh, you want to go to work, that's, that's certainly understandable. I'm going to do something just a little bit different. I'm going to try to get through all the material. We've got a lot of material to get through, but I'm going to try to get through the material. But what I'm really going to do is, is tell you a story, 
And then, if we have time, I'm going to sing a song. <laughs> and you, you, you wait. Um, the, uh, and that should keep you here. You really, really need to hear that song. Uh, anyway, uh, let me tell you the story. I think the best things, I often tell jokes and give forecasts, and as people know, it's sometimes difficult to tell which is the joke and which is the forecast. But, but um, the best jokes or best stories, the best jokes are stories, real true stories. And I'll share with you a true story that happened to me, which uh, allows me to drop names, but also is very proud, but also very entertaining. And it happened in 1987. 1987, uh, Alan Greenspan was selected, uh, was selected to, uh, was nominated to, to relieve or to take over for Paul Volcker as chairman of the Federal Reserve. And as often is the case, the financial press will call me and ask me what my opinion was. And my opinion uh, to USA Today called me and I said, well, Alan Greenspan is a good, is a, is a very able economist, but he lacks Paul Volcker's depth of understanding of the Federal Reserve System. That's really not a profound statement because Paul Volcker was essentially grew up, was trained, uh, was a professional in the Federal Reserve System. Uh, the next day on the front page of USA Today, not the money section, but on the front page of the newspaper, it said Hugh Johnson uh, says that Alan Greenspan lacks Paul Volcker's depth. <laughs> Period. <laughs> well, that was not good. And that didn't make me feel very comfortable. And about two weeks later, I was uh, having lunch with Bill Seidman. Bill Seidman, as you remember, some of you remember, was chairman of the FDIC. And I said, hey, Bill, you don't know, suppose Alan Greenspan reads something as trashy as USA Today. And he said, oh, he, said, he, he reads it, he, he reads everything. He doesn't miss a thing. So I went back to my office and I composed this very carefully worded letter to Greenspan and told him that I was, was taken out of context, here's what I really said, and I wished him best of luck as chairman of the Federal Reserve. Two weeks later, I got back a handwritten note from Greenspan. It said, I missed the alleged quote, but thanks for bringing it to my attention. <laughs> it's a true story. The, um, okay, you, you know, uh, uh, we we got together last year. We had an important question, though. We are we are currently we're currently at the uh, 122 month mark of the uh, current bull market, which makes this uh, the longest bull market in history. Uh, we're at the 118-month mark of the uh, economic expansion, and uh, in two months, this is going to be the longest economic expansion in our history. Uh, so, so common sense alone says that you've got to start to be uh, on your toes. As I said to people before, and as I've said to audiences over and over again, trees don't grow to the sky. So the most important question that faces us this year is the same question that faced us last year. And that is, uh, are we near or are we at the end of the current, the 11th cycle in the post-war period? There have been 10 prior cycles. This is the 11th cycle. Or in the immortal words of Gerald Ford, has the pendulum come full circle? Uh, if, if it has, if it has come full circle, uh, as Yogi Berra used to say, when you get to the fork in the road, you need to take it. Um, and which really means that if we have gotten near or at the end of the current cycle, that's really the question. Uh, if we're at the end of the bull market and the start of a bear market, or the end of the economic expansion and the start of a contraction or a recession, uh, it would be a good thing uh, to know that. Then we need to change uh, our, the principal objective of our investment portfolio from offense to defense or from capital appreciation to capital preservation. And we need to change the essential strategy of our business from offense to defense to defect, to, to pretend uh, to defend uh, our businesses. So that to me uh, is really the, the, the key question that we face. I've spent most of my life trying to figure out how to answer questions, important questions, uh, just like that. And the only thing that I can uh, tell you is that the only way to do this uh, that I think is uh, that works and works success successfully over time is uh, a methodology which really consists of, of uh, four steps. Uh, the, um, the, the two of those steps are very important. The first is to identify important trends that are unfolding in the financial markets. No individual investor knows where we're going, but investors collectively tend to get it right. 
So the, uh, look at the financial markets, the important trends that are unfolding in the financial markets, and what do they tell you that investors collectively believe is going to happen to the uh, economy and earnings inflation and, and interest rates. So looking at the financial markets, identify important trends in the financial markets is the first important step. The second important step is to identify uh, meaningful or important trends in important monetary and economic variables, and that's the purpose of that is to find out, indeed, if the economic and monetary variables verify the trends that are unfolding uh, in the financial markets. Uh, the, whole purpose, the whole purpose of that is to identify where you are in the current cycles. Uh, so current cycle, I, uh, the cycle consists of really three parts. Uh, a stock market cycle, which is followed by an economic cycle, which is followed by an interest rate cycle. And the work that I've done uh, uh, determine, pr proves fairly clearly that the uh, financial markets on the one hand and the monetary and economic variables on the other hand perform in very specific ways at the beginning, the middle, and the end of a cycle. So if by identifying important trends in the markets, uh, important trends in monetary and economic variables, you can uh, identify where you are in the uh, three-part cycle, then making important investment decisions, such as asset allocation, the percentage of your portfolio you want to allocate to equities, percentage to fixed income securities, Th those decisions become uh, easier. They don't become easy, but they certainly, uh, in some ways, uh, become easy. Uh, so that's important. That's something we're going to go through today and, and try to do uh, relatively quickly. If you've done that, as I said last year, and as I will say again this year, you really haven't finished uh, your job. Uh, because uh, as we're going through uh, a normal cycle, a stock market, business, interest rate cycle, uh, there are things that happen along the way that are somewhat disruptive. We'll call them manias. Uh, I've talked to you about this uh, in the past. Um, the, uh, uh, there are really five stages, but four stages of, of a mania. Uh, the stage of investment, uh, you know, you buy a house uh, to live in the house. Uh, you, you're an investor which is followed by the stage of, of, of speculation characterized by the emotion of, of uh, euphoria where investors become speculators and they borrow money uh, to buy a second, third, and a fourth home, uh, probably in Florida, maybe in Nevada, uh, to buy a second, third, and a fourth home, maybe in Columbia County, uh, to buy a second, third, and a fourth home with at prices that are arguably overvalued with the hope and the dream and the fantasy that the prices are going to become uh, even uh, more overvalued. Uh, as Galbraith says, the circumstances that induce recurrent lapses into financial dementia have not changed in any truly operative fashion since the tulip mania of 1636-1637. Um, there, there's, there's a sucker born every minute. Uh, as Kindleberger, the great, well, great economist at, at MIT who wrote probably the best book written on economics uh, and financial markets, Manias, Panics, and Crashes, says there's nothing so disturbing to one's well-being and judgment as to see a friend get rich. Um, <laughs> as, as a result, you, you collapse into this sort of environment of monkey see, monkey do, and we're, we're, we're off to the races. Um, prices don't go up forever and ever, except in the uh, sales presentations of investment uh, bankers. So you have, you have the period of speculation characterized by the emotion of euphoria, uh, which is the defining characteristics of speculation are, are prices at levels that are high and, and leverage. That's followed by the period of financial dementia uh, or financial distress. In the period of financial distress, prices for some reason are stop going up. Uh, the speculators begin to get uh, nervous. Uh, they have difficulty making the, the debt service payments. Some do not and default. Uh, the lenders who finance the speculation begin to get cold feet and start to back away from the markets. And that starts to get a little bit, you start to see a little bit of a give uh, in prices. And that's followed by the period of revulsion, the stage of revulsion. And in the stage of revulsion, as you can just imagine, there's a veritable race for the exits by the people that own the five, six, seven, eighth home in Florida. But people, so there's a race for the exits by both the speculators as well as the lenders that finance the uh, speculation. That's really a very uh, interesting uh, and difficult period. Uh, last time I was here, I told you there was a, a mania going on. Fortunately, it wasn't a widespread mania or one that would affect the entire economy and the entire markets. 
Uh, it was the mania of bitcoins. Uh, what we saw last time is bitcoins had uh, gone up uh, about 4,243% in a three-year three, three period. You didn't have to be, know a lot about manias to know that that was a mania. Uh, now we've gotten the opportunity, if you want to call it an opportunity, that sounds like a good thing, uh, to see the uh, revulsion period. Uh, the, the, the price of bitcoins now, since we last got together uh, in the period of a year, are down 80%. Um, that's what happens during a revulsion period. But don't be disappointed to think that that's the end. It might be the end of that mania or the end of revulsion for bitcoins. Don't be disappointed that there's not another one coming along. Um, here's, here's a quotation, uh, a recent quotation uh, from Larry Fink, who's the chief executive office of, uh, of BlackRock. And what, chief, what, what he sort of warns is that there is a possibility, and I would not say a probability, but there is a possibility that we could have uh, in the financial markets a melt up, not a melt down, or that uh, we could move uh, from the current stage of, of rationality into a period which is irrational, when uh, prices become uh, too high or overvalued, uh, leverage becomes very widespread, and most importantly, that optimism will become very widespread. If these markets from the current level were to rise, and I'll, I'll explain these numbers a little bit, but were to rise, say, 0.7% between now and, say, the end of this year, or something in the order of 7% uh, between now and, say, the end of 2021, uh, it would be my judgment that we'd probably be at the edge then. That doesn't sound like those are not big numbers. We'd be at the edge of a period uh, of uh, speculation. And then we'd have to watch the uh, sentiment numbers to see if optimism becomes very widespread. So that is a distinct possibility. Let's quickly go through. Okay, any questions so far? Because I want to make this conversational if possible, because sometimes I say things, I go through things, and I lose people. And, uh, and, and if there's some, you know, as I say, go back and explain that, be more clear. Uh, let me just go now and touch base on what the current financial market trends are. Uh, fortunately, uh, the trend in the uh, equity markets, uh, we saw the uh, decline in the fourth quarter, a very sharp decline, which turned out uh, not to be the start of uh, a bear market that was going to be accompanied by a recession. The reason we knew that was not going to be uh, the decline that we saw in the fourth quarter, a bear market to be accompanied by a recession, is because of the monetary and economic variables told us that although the stock market declined and certainly was performing very much as it does at the beginning of a bear market, the economic variables, the monetary and economic variables that we also look at said no, uh, the signs are not that we're at uh, the end of the current cycle. So that we determined, decided at the end of December that that was just simply a correction in an ongoing bull market and again not the start of a bear market to be accompanied by a recession. Since that uh, decline that we saw in December, uh, the stock market as measured by the S&P 500 up 21.7%. Uh, in addition to that, uh, investors have migrated to the so-called uh, bull market sectors of the market and away from the so-called safe or bear market sectors, safe sectors such as the ones in red there, I hope you can see that in red, consumer staples, uh, utilities, uh, and the like. Uh, the sectors of the safe sectors, of course, are the stock sectors that conclude stocks which will uh, perform well, will provide uh, growth in revenues and earnings regardless of what's happening to the underlying economy. That's not true of the economically sensitive sectors such as technology and consumer discretionary, which only do well if, you're, if the economy is expanding and earnings, earnings are uh, growing. So investors have been, been buying the so-called economically sensitive or bull market sectors. In addition, investors have been taking risk by buying mid-capitalization stocks and uh, shying away from or starting to uh, leave a large, safer, so-called perceived to be safer, large capitalization stocks. Uh, what's, what's also true uh, in the equity markets, in sectors and capitalization, is also true in the, in the fixed income markets. In the fixed income markets, although interest rates declined rather sharply uh, from November straight through uh, most of the first quarter, it looks to me as though interest rates, as measured by the yield on a 10-year treasury, are starting to turn up. Importantly, um, the, 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 the spread or the difference between the yield on a BAA corporate bond and a 10-year treasury, between a, a corporate bond and a 10-year treasury. Uh, th that yield uh, spread or difference 
is narrowing. And that only happens when investors are uh, somewhat confident or increasing their confidence that the economy is going to continue uh, to expand and that the payments are going to be made on both interest and principal of their uh, corporate bond. Uh, it's not only true of what we call investment grade bonds, such as BAA corporate bonds, it's also true of junk bonds. The difference between the yield on a junk bond uh, or below investment grade uh, fixed income security in a 10-year treasury has also narrowed uh, sharply uh, during the first quarter. Again, a uh, fairly clear indication that investors believe that the economy is going to continue to expand. And finally, and probably the most important number that we'll look at is the so-called yield curve. And I apologize for being a little bit technical, but the yield curve is really important. It's measured by the, there are a lot of ways of measuring it. And believe me, you'll read about it in the newspapers and they're all wrong. Uh, but the right way to measure this is, is the difference between the yield on a 10-year treasury and a 91-day treasury bill or the federal funds rate. And that's also been narrowing. Uh, that's also been narrowing, and that's a, some indication that investors are becoming just a little bit concerned or maybe nervous about the economy. The, the, the quality spreads that you're seeing between a BAA corporate bond and a 10-year treasury or between junk bonds and a 10-year treasury or the decline in the yield curve, these are all symptomatic or characteristic of the way the fixed income markets perform in an expanding economy or an economy where investors collectively believe that the economy is going to continue to expand. So the point being is that whether you look at the equity markets or you look at the fixed income markets, the, fixed, the message of, the, of, the, of investors collectively is, uh, is that the economy is, we may be near the end of the, of the current cycle, but we're not at the end of the cycle. They're optimistic that the cycle is going to continue uh, through 2019 and perhaps into 2020. We can put some numbers on this. And the way we put numbers on this is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York quantifies the probability that it was like, this is very hard to read, and this is very technical, and I apologize once again. But the Federal Reserve Bank in New York quantifies the probability of a recession starting in 12 months based on the yield curve today, the difference between the 10-year Treasury and a 91-day key bill. And the probability of a recession has been increasing. You see it down at the bottom. It's been increasing towards 27% but it's still not really high. And we have to wait until it gets to be about 30% uh, before, we start to get, um, before we start to get extremely uh, concerned. And remember, that's the yield curve today telling us the probability of a recession starting uh, 12 months from uh, today. Uh, take a look at the numbers that we saw uh, when the financial crisis started until the beginning of 2008. At the beginning of 2008, as you can see at the top of the page, uh, the probability was about 37 to 40 percent that we'd see a recession. That was at the beginning of 2008, and it was based on the yield curve at the beginning of 2007. So at the beginning of 2007, you had a clear signal that you were headed towards problems at the beginning of 2008. When we take a look at the yield curve now, it's saying, well, you got to be a little nervous, you got to be watching it very carefully, but it's not at the level, certainly not at the level we saw at the beginning of 2008, but it's at a level where we've got to start to weed watching it pretty carefully. Hopefully that's clear. Okay, so there's the message of the financial markets. The message of the financial markets collectively is we're going to be okay. The economy is going to continue to expand some. Um, the question is, is that, uh, is that message of the financial markets consistent with uh, what we're getting on the monetary and economic variable side of the equation? I'm going to go through this quickly because this can really get um, uh, technical. And essentially, let's, it, it, it's a fairly clear and simple story. Um, despite the fact that the Federal Reserve had been raising short-term interest rates, uh, short-term interest rates, as measured by uh, a lot of different measures, uh, certainly the real federal funds rate, which is probably the best way to measure Federal Reserve policy, at 0.5% remains accommodative or fairly low. Uh, certainly lower than the long-term average, and again, this is the real or inflation-adjusted federal funds rate uh, below, below the uh, long-term average of 1.2%. It's true that the Federal Reserve has been backing out of the, uh, of the financial markets effectively, uh, turning, turning it back to the banks, uh, that they have been reducing their purchases of, of treasuries, reducing the size of their balance sheet. But even though they've done that, the level of reserves in the banking system, the level of reserves in the banking system that are there to support bank lending and money growth is really, really substantial. Uh, as you can see at the bottom there, it's 1.5. 
uh, five three three trillion uh, trillion dollars. There are enough reserves in the banking system to support all the bank lending and money growth that you can possibly imagine. As a result of that, we've seen uh, lending uh, start to increase. Lending is now turning higher. Uh, the sec uh, because lending has turned higher, we're starting to see some growth in the money supply. And that although liquidity conditions were negative, that is, it, although it was the case that there wasn't enough money to drive both the economy and the markets, uh, those numbers, which are negative still, are starting, turning towards being more positive. So bank lending is increasing, money growth is increasing, domestic liquidity conditions are improving, or it's starting to become the case that there's enough money to drive both the economy and the financial markets. Uh, the next slide I'm going to go past because it's way too complex. It really just simply says, when the Federal Reserve backed out of the financial system, uh, when they stopped buying treasuries and they stopped buying mortgages, uh, foreign investors uh, stepped in. And it gets, it's a complex story, but they stepped in and they stepped in in substantial size and offset uh, the reduction in buying by the, uh, by the uh, Federal Reserve. Uh, as, a result of, uh, as a result of improving money conditions, uh, leading indicators for the economy, indicators that tell us where the economy is going, not where the economy has been, uh, continue to rise 20 of the last 24 months, and it looks like the number for the month of April is also going to be up when we see it at the end of May. So the point is, simple, uh, straightforward. Uh, the point message of the financial markets is the economy is going to continue to expand through the remainder of 2019, and that's confirmed by the uh, message of uh, looking at important uh, monetary and economic variables, particularly money conditions, which uh, are improving uh, or getting better. Not great, but, 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 but getting better. Okay, let's try to quantify now what the outcome is going to be. Um, these, this is, this is uh, in each of these slides, uh, you've got two things. Well, not all of them slides. You've got two things. You've got the consensus forecast, and you've got my forecast. And in most cases, you'll see that they kind of track each other pretty much the same. Uh, what I would pay attention to, because there's so many numbers up there and you can't really get them all. Incidentally, I'll make these slides all available to anybody. Just, just give your card to Mike or somebody and, and we'll, we'll send you the slides. Because again, there are a lot of numbers up there. But pay attention perhaps to the, uh, the slides or the, the, the numbers at the bottom, which will tell you the average for 2018, 2019 and 2020. As you can see, first of all, let's start with point one. Point one is that economic growth has been, not only for Columbia County, but the country as a whole, very slow. Uh, economic growth has been very slow uh, for uh, the growth rate, the average growth rate per quarter in this recovery is 2.3 percent. The average growth rate in all of the recoveries prior to uh, prior to this recovery, the average growth rate per quarter of 3.7%. So we've come down from 3.7 to 2.3. Uh, the, the reason that we've come down so, so much is because of a combination of, of factors. First of all, the growth rate of the population uh, has slowed and has slowed uh, sig significantly. Uh, the, the birth rate is, is the lowest it's been since 1937. Uh, so the growth rate of the population has slowed uh, and, and has uh, s slowed significantly, and that's not in small part due to a, a significant uh, slowdown in immigration. Uh, so the growth rate of the population has slowed. As a, res as a result of that, the growth rate of the, of the labor force, all of us that are working, the growth rate of the labor force has slowed significantly in the current recovery. In part, it has slowed because of a decline in the so-called participation rate, or the percentage uh, of the population that are either uh, actively looking for a job or do have a job. And, and the principal reason that the participation rate has come down during the current recovery is largely demographics. A lot of the baby boomers are dropping out of the labor force and retiring. Uh, this is changing, and it's changing in an important way. Uh, it's also uh, come down, the participation rate, because women uh, have become care caregivers and uh, care providers, both to the young and to the old, and have dropped out of the labor force. So the participation rate has come down. As a result of that, the labor force has come down, the labor force which provides the, the output or the productivity for, for the GDP. Um, in addition, the, tech, the, the, 
the, the, the productivity of that labor force has also come down. So not only do you have fewer labor per workers, but you also have the output of those workers has also come down. And as a result, GDP, which measures output per worker, um, uh, total output for the economy, has come down and the economy has slowed in the current recovery. Now that's kind of complex, and I'd be happy to answer questions on that uh, once, we, uh, once we get to it. Uh, that's, that's the big secular problem. There's also a cyclical, cyclical problem. And the cyclical problem is simple. Uh, the, the, the unemployment rate is low. There's tightness in the labor markets. Uh, there's a little bit of upward pressure on wages, but not much. There's tightness in the labor markets, and it's very difficult. The, the growth rate of jobs is going to slow down simply because the uh, unemployment rate um, is, is so, so low. So we've got a secular problem, and we've got a cyclical problem. And those two problems have made, made it guaranteed that the economy is going to slow. Now, these, this is interestingly enough, and nobody, not many people are saying this or seeing this, is changing. And the reason it's changing is, is kind of simple. It, it, first of all, uh, the uh, growth rate of the labor force in 2018 uh, picked up quite a bit from the average of prior months of the current uh, recovery. And the reason the growth rate of the labor force has picked up is because the participation rate, the percentage of those that are employed or looking for a job, has picked up. And the reason that the participation rate in the labor force has picked up is largely because women are coming back into the labor force. And they're usually very educated women. They've stopped becoming caregivers, back into the labor force, and are now uh, working. As a result of that, you saw numbers for the first quarter. Uh, gross domestic product came in at 3.2%. The expectation 2.5% economists tend to be a little bit low. So you look at these numbers up here, and you'll see that the consensus, the consensus forecast is the economy is going to continue to slow. 2019, 2020, and, and it also would have said 2021 if I could get it up there. But the economy is going to slow. Uh, you'll see that my numbers are that it's not going to slow as much. And the principal reason I say it's not going to slow as much is because, again, we're seeing a pickup in the labor force, a pickup in the participation rate, and the number of women coming back into the labor force is substantial. The unfortunate part is, is, is this, is that if you look at the companies uh, in the, so the top ten companies, you'll see that although their revenues are, are up substantially, these are the top ten companies in 1990 compared to the top ten companies uh, today. Uh, what you'll notice is a substantial increase in revenues, uh, and I, I can't see the numbers, but it's about 448%, and uh, a not so substantial increase in the number of workers that are actually providing those revenues, 184%, I think, I can't see the, can't see the chart. And the reason for that, and the reason for that is, is the, the economy is fundamentally changing. It's changing from a labor-intensive economy to a knowledge-driven economy, and that's been made possible by the exponential progress in technology, which we could talk about at length, and that's not going to end anytime soon. So we've got the cyclical and the secular problem, but the most important thing is you've got a lot of people re-entering the labor force, and that's good news, but the problem is... Oh, five minutes. Okay, well, I can't do it in five minutes, I'll try six. Okay. Um, all right. All right. So, at any rate, uh, that's going to be, that fundamental change is going to mean that although the economy is likely to pick up some, it's not going to be as slow as the consensus that it's, uh, in my judgment, it's likely to be, uh, it's, 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 likely, it's likely not to be too, too quick. Uh, we could go through a lot of numbers here, but let me get right to uh, the, my five-minute limit. Uh, first of all, uh, the economy is going to continue to grow. Inflation, uh, when we take a look at the inflation numbers through 2000, uh, 2019, 2020, it's, uh, it's hard to make the case for significant upward pressure on hourly earnings or wages. It's also hard to make the case for significant upward pressure on inflation. Uh, under those conditions, uh, uh, in my judgment, the Federal Reserve is likely to stick to their guns and not raise interest. Who knows what the Federal Reserve is going to do? But if I were to guess that it'll likely leave interest rates unchanged through 2019 and raise rates one time in 2000, uh, 2020. 
In addition to that, uh, other rates will uh, go up, will trend up. Short-term interest rates will trend up. They will not trend up as much as what we talked about last year, but they'll trend up some. That's true not only of, of short-term rates as measured by the yield on a two-year treasury, but also 10-year uh, rates as measured by a 10-year uh, treasury. Um, stock prices. I have two forecasts, and I want you to get these charts. I have two forecasts for stock prices, and the difference between the two is that um, the difference between the two is my forecast for earnings. I can make two forecasts for earnings. They're not significantly different between the two. Now, what they say is important. And what they say is, and I'm trying to work these numbers in every way I can to make them good. I like good numbers, but I can't. And that is somewhere between what they say now, uh, and this is grandiose of me to even forecast it, is what these tables say is that the stock market will peak uh, either to the second quarter of 2020 or the second quarter of 2021, depending on which forecast you use. And it'll peak... Uh, between 0.7% above current levels or 7% above current levels. Uh, in my judgment, it'll be somewhere probably uh, between those two numbers. Uh, when I say this is late in this current recovery uh, and uh, trees don't grow for the sky, uh, that's very consistent with this uh, forecast. This forecast is giving me uh, the same message. I wish I could be more cheerful, but I think that uh, the truth is, is that we're coming, uh, we're at, or coming uh, near uh, the end of the current cycle, and I think that's going to be sometime in the latter part of uh, 2020. What I've also done, and I'll quickly go through this because this is pretty important, is the state and the county. And I just want to give you the numbers and hope that you'll come and get these numbers because I've, I've, I've made a forecast for every county in New York State, um, and that takes time. Um, and first of all, as always, the state economy, as much as we try to change it, make the state grow fast or slow, it, it's going to do the same thing it always does, which is it's going to mirror the national economy. It's not going to, it'll be maybe a little bit stronger in employment, a little bit stronger in gross product, but it's not going to be much different from the performance of the national economy. You can see that in here. Uh, New York State uh, is going to be a good, it's going to perform well in New England. Uh, it's going to be uh, right at the top of the New England states, without, uh, with the exception of Vermont, which is probably going to be at the top because of the growth rate. It'll be good because it's small. Uh, but Massachusetts and New Hampshire have always been at the top. New York will be right there with them uh, over the course of 2019, 2020, and the combination of uh, 2019 and 2020. So good performance for New York State. Uh, as far as counties go, uh, a lot of the local counties are going to do uh, uh, pretty well. And uh, this unfortunately divides up, as you might expect, uh, downstate economies are going to uh, have faster employment growth and the upstate economies are going to have slower. Uh, but you do see really pr pretty positive numbers coming out of places uh, like uh, Saratoga, Rensselaer, and, and Albany. Not bad at all. Um, that's, that's taking the largest, uh, the largest um, uh, counties, and then I do it for those, uh, the top uh, 19 and the bottom 19. Uh, the good news is, uh, and I didn't jimmy these numbers because I'm coming here, um, <laughs> believe me, uh, Columbia really, really looks good. Uh, and I, I always ask the question when I look at this, for example, I looked at Sullivan County, I said, what the heck is going on there? But the point, maybe you can answer the question. When, Columbia is 11th out of 38th uh, in the outcome, and your growth rate in employment uh, for 2019 and 20, 1.1%, which means you're going to increase the number of jobs for whatever reason uh, in 2019 and 2020 significantly. And so you're going to be right near, the, right near the top of the performance of all the counties which have less than 50 a thousand employees. And again, I did not jimmy these numbers. I've been giving you the numbers as, they, as the computer uh, produces it. Okay. Do I have time for my song? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Objection, so ordered. Okay. I'm going to sing you a song, and that will be the end of this. <laughs> Which will be happy. Uh, if you do have questions, I'd be happy to answer the questions, and please get the slides. They'll give you all the information you could ever not want. Um, and this is something I stole. 
and I stole it from Julie Andrews. And, and Julie Andrews uh, sang this song. Uh, some of you may have heard it. She sang it at Radio City Music Hall to celebrate her 79th birthday. Uh, maybe you can recognize it. And it's so appropriate given me, my age, and also Julie. Botox and nose drops and needles for knitting, walkers and handrails and new dental fittings, bundles of magazines tied up in a string. These are a few of my favorite things. Cadillacs and cataracts and hearing aids and glasses, polydent and fixident and false teeth and glasses, pacemakers, golf carts, and porches with swings. These are a few of my favorite things. When the pipes leak, when the bones creak, when the knees go bad, I simply remember my favorite things, and then I don't feel so bad. Hot tea, hot teas and crumpets and corn pads for bunions. No spicy fat food or food cooked with onions. Bathrobes and heating pads and hot meals they bring. These are a few of my favorite things. Back pain, confused brains, and no need for sin in thing, thin bones and fractures, hair that is thin in, and we don't mention our short trunk and frames when we remember our favorite things. When the joints ache, when the hips break, when the eyes grow dim, then I remember the great life I've had, and then I don't feel so bad. great entertainment, and a great prediction for the 2019-2020 Columbia County economy. I uh, want to thank all of you again for being here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dave Finger for serving as our board chair. I've already enjoyed working with you, Dave, and look forward to continuing to work together under your leadership. I also want to join Dave in thanking Tony Jones for his years of service to CEDC and our community. Tony, your leadership insight and friendship have made an incredible mark on CEDC and you have made my job much easier, so thank you. And Jim Campion, uh, I've enjoyed working with you over the last 10 plus years during my time at the Center for Economic Growth as well as CEDC. You have truly made a difference in the lives of thousands of students during your incredible tenure at the college and we thank you. Jim, Tony, and Dave are great examples of our board of directors. We are fortunate to have a board that takes the work of economic development seriously and makes important contributions to all of our initiatives. We are also grateful to the boards of the Hudson Industrial Development Agency and the Columbia County Industrial Development Agency with whom we work very closely. We also have a great team at CEDC and I join Dave in recognizing them and thank them for their dedication and commitment. Please join me as well in recognizing Lisa Derusik, Erin McNary, Carol Wilbur, Ed Steffler, Martha Lane, and Kayla Dunce for the great job they do day in and day out, and especially to Carol Wilbur, uh, who coordinates our membership campaign and this event this morning. Thank you. <laughs> I also want to thank our sponsors, uh, our event sponsor, Berkshire Bank, and the other sponsors listed on the placard at your table, as well as the staff here at Kozels who always do such a great job. We are fortunate to have committed partners throughout every sector in our community, many of whom are here today. Succeeding and growing an economy requires ongoing collaboration between a wide range of voices viewpoints, and opinions, including our federal, state, and local elected officials, leaders in business, government, education, and the not-for-profit sector, 
and community groups and county residents. Working across our diverse industry sectors, agribusiness, the creative economy, arts, culture, tourism, recreation, hospitality, manufacturing and technology, retail, service businesses, healthcare, and the social services, we have worked together to advance the cause of those businesses and industries. We, in doing so, we have updated our strategic plan. And our plan affirms our commitment to, a broad, to this broad range of industries and stakeholders by organizing our activities into four pillars. Entrepreneurship and innovation, infrastructure, quality of life, and workforce edu and education. These projects, these four pillars are, will help us to continue to focus, to identify where we should lead, where we should provide support, and where we should partner. We do this work in partnership because it has a real impact on the quality of life of the community we serve. We are here because we all believe in the future of Columbia County and the positive impact of investing and engaging in economic development. We particularly appreciate our partnership with Empire State Development, Mike Yevely and his team, Katie Newcomb at National Grid, Todd Erling at Hudson Valley Agribusiness Development, and Jeff Hunt at the Chamber. The dedication and commitment and collaborative relationship that we have with so many organizations is key to our ongoing efforts towards perfecting our strategy and practices to improve our success. There's no finish line in economic development, and the last several years have given me great optimism as to the future of what we can accomplish together. When we are successful, it means more people have high paying jobs, our local governments have a broader tax base, the Columbia County is a more attractive place to live and work. Seeing the turnout here today, representing so many different companies and organizations across the full spectrum of economic activity, I have confidence that our successes will only grow in the coming years. Again, thank you to our sponsors for making this event possible. Thank you to our members, our partners, our board, staff, and all who have done so much already uh, for all of the work that we will continue to do in the years ahead. And now I will move to our annual meeting, which will be very short and brief, but it is required by the State Authority Budget Office. So uh, we'll be in compliance, but again, uh, my full report is in our printed annual report, and I, uh, uh, again, uh, we'll now ask a finger to come back up and quickly hold our annual meeting. We need to uh, approve our minutes from last year. And there's a motion to approve those minutes. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Carried. Thank you. Our financial report, Patterson, Kosky, Howe, and Bucci, CPAs, conducted an independent audit for the year ending December 31st, 2018. The audit reflected an opinion that the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with U.S. accounting principles. We're pleased to report that there were no findings, and as of December 31st, 2018, CEDC had total assets of $3.6 million total liabilities of 624,000 for net assets of $2.9 million. For the year ended December 31st, 2018, we had revenues of 1.1 million, expenses of 754,000 for a net profit of 391,000, principally from the sale of land. Comparing operations in 2018 to those of 2017, Operating revenue was higher by approximately $340,000. Expenses were lower uh, than 2017 by $15,000. Uh, our next uh, annual meeting issue, is there one more item on the agenda? Yeah. We'll have Jim Campion come up and uh, do the Governance and Nominating Committee report. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm pleased to present the names of directors who are up for election this year. Uh, please stand if you're present. Uh, board of direct our board of directors has selected 
uh, Richard Cummings III, Mulhern Gas Company, uh, to complete a term ending May 1st, 2020. Derek Grout, of Harvest Spirits, to complete a term ending May 1st, 2021. And the following directors are presented to fill a three-year term expiring on May 1st, 2022. Uh, Jim Calvin from the New York Association of Convenience Stores, Patricia Finnegan, Columbia Memorial Health, James LePen, retired attorney, John Lee, Saturn Industries, Seth Rapcore, Valley Mortgage Company Incorporated, Dr. Maria Suttmeyer, Superintendent, Hudson City School District. Can I have a motion from a member to approve the slate as presented? So moved. Second? Any Second. Any figure seconds? All in favor of the slate as presented? Say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion is carried and the slate is elected as presented. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Again, thank you all for being here. Uh, we wanted to be sure that uh, we were out earlier than last year. It's 918. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>